Good morning, chemistry students. This is Mrs. Crumshiner with your Chapter 8, Day 2 notes. We are going to do be finishing up um, Section 1 of our Chapter 8 from our textbook. We'll be starting at balancing chemical equations and finishing with some examples. So just to kind of remind you about what we talked about yesterday or previously is that um, typically, information for writing and balancing a chemical equation is going to be given to you in some sort of sentence or paragraph. Okay. And you're going to take that sentence and paragraph, and the first thing that you're going to do is you're going to write what's called a word equation. So again, when we're talking about chemical reactions here, remember we're always changing substances and we write our reactants on the left and our products on the right. Okay, So in our word equation, our reactants are on the left, our products are on the right. So those are the new substances that we form, those are the products. Right, and they go on the right. Okay. Um, again, we're having bonds broken and new bonds formed, but atoms can't be created or destroyed. They're just rearranged. So as we start to talk today about how we actually balance these equations, you are going to be atom counters. In a word equation, our only symbols that we use are plus sign and the arrow. Okay, um, the plus signs, remember, they're kind of representing the words reacts with or and, and the arrow can be to produce, producing, forming, yielding, to form, to yield, okay, quite a few different words. And again, remember, our purpose of our word equation is it kind of gets rid of extra information that's not particularly important for us for balancing our equation and it allows us to focus on what's important. So again, the only thing symbols in a word equation are those plus signs and arrows. But we're getting rid of extra information like um, oxygen gas from the air, right? We can get rid of gas and from the air, okay? Um, once we have our word equation in our effort to write a balanced chemical equation, um, we're, our first thing we're going to write is called a skeleton equation. The difference between our skeleton equation and our word equation is that now everything is symbols using our chemical symbols. In our skeleton equation, remember, it's important that our um, chemical formulas are written correctly. So again, it's why it's really important that you maybe go back and take a look at Chapter 6 and your outline and really kind of review and spend some time looking at how you write the chemical formulas for ionic and molecular compounds given their names. And again, if that's something you need some help with, then just come and see me and we can work through that individually. A skeleton equation, remember, is an unbalanced chemical equation. Okay, so we haven't balanced it yet. We've just taken um, the words that still existed in our word equation and we've made them symbols. And that's kind of how far we were the other day. And really the last step after our skeleton equation that we're going to talk about today is that we're going to have a balanced equation. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. And as you saw in the chem class that you've already done, um, we're going to balance equations by using coefficients. So that brings us to your new information on your outline. So we're talking again about kind of finishing out of how do we balance these chemical equations. Um, and again, we're going to kind of start with um, a kind of one definition of a balanced equation, which is that a balanced equation is a complete description okay. of the reaction okay. 
including both the kinds and quantities or amounts required. So again, the difference between that skeleton equation and that balanced equation is that we're going to have equal numbers of all of our atoms. Okay, So a balanced equation gives the correct quantity or amount of each reactant and product. So as you saw on a ChemQuest, the way that we go about balancing our equation and getting a balanced chemical equation is that we're going to use a coefficient. A coefficient is a number placed in front of the symbols or formulas in our chemical equation. So again, what's important here is that we don't try to put our coefficient in the middle of our chemical formula. If we need a coefficient, it has to go in front of the entire chemical formula. And these coefficients are used to balance our chemical equation. which again, our chemical equation is representing some sort of chemical reaction. And kind of to do this, the rule that we're following is that we must follow the law of conservation of mass. which again just means that atoms cannot be created or destroyed, they're just rearranged. And how we're going to use this, right, is you're going to become what I call atom counters. You're going to count to see whether you have the same number of all of the atoms on both the reactant and the product side of your equation. Because the mass of an element doesn't change during a chemical reaction, we don't have to actually do math to balance these. We can just make sure we have the same number of every type of atom on both the reactants and product side of our equation, and we will know that we are following the law of conservation of mass. So we're going to use these coefficients to get our balanced equation. And when we have a properly balanced e equation, okay, each side of the equation. So what we mean by that is both the reactant side and the product side has the same number of atoms of each element. So when our chemical equation is properly balanced, we're going to have exactly the same number of every atom on both sides of our chemical equation. So again, what are the steps for balancing chemical equations? Again, I kind of want to remind you that you're going to be starting with either a sentence or a paragraph. And I would suggest you're going to want to first write a word equation, especially if you find that you're struggling with this. Then it's even more important that the first thing you do with the sentence or paragraph that you're given describing a chemical reaction is that you write a word equation. 
Again, because it allows you to get rid of that extra information that's really not important, and it allows you to focus on the parts that are important. So, again, kind of assuming we're starting at this word equation part, how do we go from there? Our first step is we're going to write an arrow. And again, I would suggest you typically put your arrow kind of towards the middle because you're going to have some reactants and you're going to have some products. And so you're going to have to have room to put right things on both sides of your arrow. Your second step is that you're going to write the correct formula for each substance. And again, that's where it's really important that you're able to recognize whether or not your compound right, is ionic or molecular, right? If it's ionic, which remember means it has a metal and a nonmetal or it has a polyatomic ion in it, then to write the formula given the name, you're going to write the symbols, you're going to write the charges, you're going to crisscross just the numbers of the charges, and then you're going to make sure you have the lowest whole number ratio. My, many of the uh, reactions that you're going to deal with are going to be ionic compounds, okay, and will involve ionic compounds. To know something's a molecular compound, it's going to be made of two nonmetals, and remember with molecular compounds, um, with the naming, the prefixes become subscripts. Okay, The other substance you have to be careful about are the diatomic molecules. You have to remember those seven substances and their elements, really, but when they're not bonded to any atom, you have to write them as being diatomic. So if one of your reactants is fluorine, that means that when you write it as a chemical formula, you have to write it as F2. So it's important that you remember your diatomic molecules. So you had your word equation, right? You took your sentence, you wrote a word equation. Now you're trying to write your balanced chemical equation, so you've written your arrow, and for everything that was still a word in your word equation, you've written the correct chemical formula for each substance. Okay, And again, you kind of probably are going to have done part of this step already, but you're going to place the formulas on the correct side. of the arrow, depending on whether it's a reactant in which case it goes on the left side of the arrow or a product, in which case it goes on the right side of your arrow. Again, this is made a little bit easier when you've already written your word equation because you've already done that. This is important because sometimes um, your textbook is going to try to fool you. Uh, they'll say something like um, aluminum chloride is formed from its elements. Well, aluminum chloride is formed. That means aluminum chloride is actually the product, okay? So you do want to kind of pay attention to this and make sure you've done this correctly. At this point, you have a skeleton equation. So you have an unbalanced chemical equation because that's what a skeleton equation is. Okay, so at this point, everything's in um, symbols and you have your skeleton equation. Again, in this, you're gonna use 
a plus sign to separate multiple reactants or products. So if you have more than one reactant or you have more than one product, you'll put in a plus sign between um, those chemical formulas. Again, a suggestion here, make sure you leave room in front of your formulas for coefficients for balancing. Okay, because you're going to have to potentially put some coefficients in front. So don't write this all so tight together that you don't have space for that. Once your formulas are correct, you may not change them. And I want you to think for a minute about why. Why is it that once I have written my chemical formulas correctly, and now I'm kind of moving on to the step where I want to start to balance my chemical equation, why can't I change my formulas? Probably the example of this that you can relate to the easiest is let's say I have H2O as one of my products, and I'm trying to balance my equation and I actually need two oxygens. So what I decide to do is change H2O to H2O2. Is that the same substance any longer? It's not, right? Big, refreshing glass of water is way different than an even tiny little sip of peroxide, okay? So the reason that once your formulas are correct, you may not change them, okay, is because if you change your subscripts, you're changing the substance altogether. If your reaction called for water and you change it to H2O2, it's not water anymore. It's something altogether different. So changing the subscripts changes what substance it is. And you don't want to do that. So again, we started with a sentence or paragraph with our chemical equation, chemical reaction. We wrote a word equation. Our only symbols in our word equation were plus signs and arrows. Everything else stayed words, but we got rid of extra information we didn't need. From that, next we wrote a skeleton equation, which is our unbalanced chemical equation. At this point, everything is in symbols. We have to take the time and make sure that we've correctly written the chemical formulas for all of our compounds because once we know our formulas are correct, we're not going to touch our subscripts anymore. The only way we're going to balance is to use our coefficients. Which brings us to step number four, which is to place coefficients in front of the formulas to make the number of atoms of each element the same on both sides. Of the arrow, okay, or on both sides of the chemical equation. So, again, now that our chemical formulas are correct, we're going to use coefficients. These coefficients go in front of the entire formula. We can't, like, do something like this, okay? So we can't have H2O 
and try to take a coefficient and write it in the middle of it. Okay, that's a no-no. Okay, if we need a coefficient, it has to go out in front of our entire chemical formula. Okay, now I have some suggestions. These come from having written and balancing chemical equations since I was in high school, which makes this a crazy amount of time. Okay, so some suggestions here. First, okay, work one atom at a time. This is one circumstance or one time where it really doesn't matter where you start. You and your friend can be working on this separately and start in different spots and you'll still end up with the same answer at a time. Just go one atom, get that atom balanced, go to a different atom, get that atom balanced, and so forth and so on. Use a pencil so you can make changes. I've been doing this a long time and I still sometimes make mistakes. You're new to this. You're going to make mistakes and realize you've mis made a mistake and not done something correctly. It's a lot easier to fix that if you're using a pencil. Always, when you think you're done, remember to double check your work. I can't tell you how many times over the years when people have taken their pop quizzes, hint, hint, pop quizzes, you're going to have some pop quizzes where you have to write and balance chemical equations. I okay? can't believe, can't tell you how many times over the years that students have gotten that pop quiz back and realized as soon as they started to look at it that it wasn't balanced because they didn't have equal numbers of all the atoms on both sides of the equation. So take the time to double check your work. Another one is sometimes for whatever reason you have a hard time seeing that lowest whole number ratio. So always make sure your coefficients are in that lowest whole number ratio. So what I mean by that is let's say you've balanced something and the coefficients that say there are four things and the coefficients you've come up with are um, you have a two in front of something, a six, uh, eight, and a four. That's not the lowest whole number ratio of coefficients, right? The lowest whole number ratio of coefficients then would be to take that two out and have a one, a three, a four, and a 2. And there are times when for whatever reason you just don't see that lowest number and it's not a big deal. Then you just go through and you fix your coefficients and then you double check your work again. Okay. Um, when we talk about working one atom at a time, another kind of reminder with this is to count polyatomic ions. as a group, if possible. So what I mean by that is if you have a sulfate ion as a reactant and a sulfate ion as a product, don't count that as sulfur, ion, sulfur and oxygen separately. Count it as sulfate ions. It'll be a lot quicker and easier to do that. Lastly, okay, Okay. Leave hydrogen and oxygen until the end, okay, if it's possible. Oftentimes, particularly in um, combustion reactions, but oftentimes hydrogen and oxygen are the most difficult atoms to balance in a chemical equation. And so sometimes if you will just start somewhere else and leave them until the very end, by the time you get to them, they're going to already have worked themselves out and be balanced. So I would never suggest you start with hydrogen or oxygen. I would always suggest you start somewhere else when you're balancing your chemical equation. So those are some suggestions I have for you.
So now that we've talked about how to write and balance chemical equations, we're going to do some examples. Again, I'm going to try to give you sentences so that you kind of get some practice with that, um, taking those sentences and um, uh, kind of oh, um, writing chemical equations. So we're going to start with um, the sentence hydrogen gas reacts with oxygen gas producing hydrogen peroxide. So that's our sentence. So again, the first thing we want to do is we want to do our word equation. So again, our word equation, I'm going to kind of put my arrow in the middle. Hydrogen gas reacts with, that means hydrogen's a reactant, and gas is extra information I don't need, so I just need the hydrogen. Reacts with becomes a plus. Oxygen gas, so again, oxygen is a reactant. Producing, that's my arrow, and hydrogen peroxide. So that's my word equation. So now I'm going to take my word equation and I'm going to do my skeleton equation. Again, in my skeleton equation, I'm going to take everything that's still words and make it symbols. I just have to be a little bit careful here because hydrogen and oxygen are both part of um, Mr. Brinklehoff. And so those are diatomic molecules. So I have to remember when I write them to write them as diatomic. So it's H2 plus. Again, I want to leave myself space in front of my oxygen so I can add a coefficient if I need it. Same thing when I write hydrogen peroxide, which is H2O2. I want to leave myself a space for a coefficient if I need it. So now this is a skeleton equation, and now I'm ready to balance this with a coefficient. So I have two hydrogens on my reactant side here. I have two hydrogens on my product side. I have two oxygens. I have two oxygens. This is a skeleton equation that is also a balanced chemical equation. I don't need any coefficients. So one of the um, problems or sentences that we've been dealing with is that sentence where we have um, iron, okay, um, so we have the sentence iron reacts with oxygen, and we can even say in the air, to produce iron 3 oxide and we even had in our original sentence also known as rust. So again, in our outline already before, we've previously done this, but the first thing to do is to make our word equation. Iron reacts with oxygen. Those are both reactants. So I have iron reacts with becomes the plus and oxygen. To produce iron 3 oxide, iron 3 oxide is my product. So that's my word equation. Now I'm ready to take this to a skeleton equation. So again, I'm going to take things that still exist as words and I'm going to make them symbols. Using your periodic table, you can look up the chemical symbol for iron, which is Fe. Again, oxygen is part of Mr. Brinklehoff, so I have to remember to write it as O2. And again, notice I've given myself plenty of space to put okay, a coefficient in front of oxygen if necessary. Iron 3 oxide, so I have to ask myself, is this ionic or molecular? Okay, This is an ionic compound because it's a metal and a nonmetal. To write the formula for an ionic compound, I'm going to write the symbols, write the charges, crisscross, make sure it's the lowest whole number ratio. My symbol for iron is Fe, and again, I'm leaving myself room in front of it for a coefficient. Remember, this 3 is telling me the charge on this iron, so it's a plus 3. 
oxide is oxygen, and I use my periodic table and the fact that oxygen is in group 6A and has six valence electrons. Therefore, it's easier for oxygen to gain two than it is to lose those six, so oxygen gets a charge of negative two. Now I'm going to crisscross down those charges, so my two comes here and my three comes here. So now I have my skeleton equation. I've taken the time, I've made sure that my chemical formulas are correct. Now I'm ready to balance this with coefficients. So I have one iron and I have two iron, so I need a coefficient of two in front of iron. I have two oxygens, I have three oxygens. So the smallest number I can make both oxygens is six. So I'm going to put a coefficient of two in front of my iron three oxide and a coefficient of three in front of my iron oxygen. Now, the issue is, right, that's changed my iron here. So again, good thing I'm working with something I can erase because it turns out I need a coefficient of four in front of my iron. I'm going to take a moment to double check my work. I have four iron. I have two times two, which makes four iron. I have three times two, which is six oxygens. I have two times three, which is six oxygens. This is correctly balanced. Another one of the sentences that you have in your outline was the methane burns in oxygen. Um, producing carbon dioxide and water. Again, that's a sentence that I've given you previously. So again, we're going to do the same thing which we actually have done already before, maybe, maybe not. Um, we're going to make this a word equation. So again, here's my arrow, right? And my arrow is the producing. So methane burns in oxygen. That means methane and oxygen are both reactants. So I'm going to have methane burns in is a plus oxygen. Producing carbon dioxide and is a plus water. So now I have my word equation. I'm ready to make this a skeleton equation. So to make this a skeleton equation, I have to write my formulas. I'm going to help you out. Methane is CH4. Oxygen, again, it's part of Mr. Brinkelhoff, so I have to write it as O2. Carbon dioxide, you know the formula for that is CO2. And water is H2O. So now I'm ready to go ahead and balance this. I have one carbon, I have one carbon, I have four hydrogens, so I need a coefficient of two in front of water. I have two oxygens here, plus two more here makes four oxygens altogether. To get four oxygens over here, I need a coefficient of two in front of oxygen. I'm going to take the moment and I'm going to check this and make sure it's correct. One carbon, one carbon four hydrogens. Two times two makes four hydrogens. Two times two makes four oxygens. Two oxygens plus two more makes four. So this is correctly balanced. All right, so another um, equation or sentence that I'm going to give you, and this is going to be a new one that you have not seen before. Okay is aluminum sulfate reacts with calcium hydroxide to yield Aluminum hydroxide
and calcium sulfate. So again, this is my sentence. Okay, and I've given you a pretty simple sentence where there's not a lot of extra information. It could be more complicated. Um, it might it could be aqueous aluminum sulfate reacts with aqueous alu calcium hydroxide to yield aqueous or solid aluminum hydroxide and aqueous calcium sulfate. Okay. Again, I'm purposely we're not gonna worry about that so much right now. So again, first thing we want to do is we want to make our word equation. So again, we're going to kind of put our arrow here in the middle. And aluminum sulfate reacts with calcium hydroxide. Those are both reactants. So here's my aluminum sulfate reacts with as a plus. Okay. Calcium hydroxide. Aluminum hydroxide then is a product, and we see that because it's after yields. And my other product is calcium sulfate. So now we're ready to take this word equation and to make it a skeleton equation. So again, everything's going to be symbols. Now, these are all iodic compounds because aluminum and calcium are metals. And if I have my metal in a compound, it's an ionic compound. So for each of these, I'm going to write my symbols. I'm going to write my charges. I'm going to crisscross. I'm going to make sure it's the lowest whole number ratio. My symbol for aluminum is Al. It has a charge of plus 3 because it's in group 3A. Sulfate that you have memorized is SO4. It has a charge of negative 2. So I'm going to crisscross down, and I need parentheses here because I need three sulfates. Plus, okay, and I want to leave some room for coefficients, which I might not have done very well there. Calcium is Ca, charge of plus 2 because it's a group 2A. Hydroxide is OH, charge of negative 1. I crisscross down and I need parentheses. Aluminum still is Al, still has a charge of plus 3. Hydroxide is still OH, still has a charge of negative 1, so I need parentheses and a 3. Calcium is still Ca, charge of plus 2. Sulfate is still SO4, charge of negative 2. Now, again, I could crisscross down these 2s, but my last step is to make sure it's the lowest whole number ratio, which I would take a 2 and a 2 and make it a 1 and a 1. So I'm just going to let it be the way it is. So now that I have my formulas correct, I'm ready to balance this. I have two aluminums here, and I have one aluminum here, so I need a coefficient of two in front of aluminum hydroxide. I have three sulfates here. I have one sulfate here, so I need a coefficient of three in front of calcium sulfate. I have one calcium here. I have three calciums here. I need a coefficient of three in front of calcium hydroxide. I have three times two, which makes six hydroxides. I have 2 times 3, which makes 6 hydroxides. So it would appear that I'm balanced. I'm going to check this. 2 aluminums, 2 aluminums, 3 sulfates, 3 sulfates, 3 calciums, 3 calciums, 3 times 2 is 6 hydroxides, 2 times 3 is 6 hydroxides. This is correctly balanced. Our last example that we're going to do Hydrogen phosphate reacts with sodium hydroxide producing sodium phosphate And water. So again, that's my sentence. 
First thing I'm going to do is make it a word equation. Okay. So hydrogen phosphate reacts with sodium hydroxide. Those are both reactants. So here's hydrogen phosphate. Here's sodium hydroxide. And again, reacts with becomes a plus. Producing is my arrow. Sodium phosphate. And is my plus water. So there's my word equation. So now I'm ready to make this a skeleton equation. So again, hydrogen phosphate, phosphate polyatomic ion, so I know it's ionic. Hydroxide polyatomic ion, I have memorized. So these are all ionic compounds. So I'm going to write symbols, charges, crisscross, lowest whole number ratio. So hydrogen phosphate, hydrogen is H plus, phosphate is PO4 negative 3. So I'm going to write this as H3PO4. Hydrogen phosphate is also known as phosphoric acid. Sodium hydroxide. Sodium is Na. Charge is plus 1. Hydroxide is OH. Charge is negative 1. So nothing to do to that one. Sodium phosphate. Again, ionic compound. Sodium is Na. Charge is plus 1. Phosphate is PO4. Charge is negative 3, so I crisscross down and I have Na3PO4. Now, normally we would write water right as H2O, but this is a double replacement reaction. And um, you saw this talked about um, on one of your chem quests, right? Hydrogen and sodium swapped partners. So the water came from hydrogen and hydroxide. And it's actually going to be easier for us to balance this if we write water as HOH coming from that positively charged hydrogen coming from the hydrogen phosphate and the hydroxide having come from the sodium hydroxide. Okay, so again, there's going to be times if you have hydroxide as a um, polyatomic ion and water as a product, it might be easier to write water as HOH, right? It's still the chemical formula for water. There's still two hydrogens and an oxygen. All right, so now we're ready to balance it. And here's why it's a little bit easier to write this as hydrogen ion and hydroxide ion because the hydroxide comes from here and the hydrogen comes from here. So as I approach balancing this, I see three hydrogens and I see one hydrogen. So I'm gonna put a coefficient of three because I'm looking at this hydrogen ion and I'm saying this is a hydrogen ion. All right, phosphate, there's just one. There's just one, so that's balanced. Sodium, I have one. There's three sodiums here, so I need a coefficient of three in front of sodium hydroxide. I have three hydroxides, I have three hydroxides, so that is balanced. So I think it's balanced, I'm going to check it. When I check it, I'm going to count all my hydrogens together. So I have three hydrogens here, plus three more here makes six. I have three and three, which makes six. Okay, one phosphorus, one phosphorus, four oxygens, plus three more makes seven oxygens, four oxygens, plus three more makes seven oxygens. This is correctly balanced. So again, that's just a little trick that comes from lots and lots of experience doing these. All right, your homework is to have you practice doing some of these on your own. On page 211, I want you to do nine through 12, and I'm gonna be very specific here. And I'm going to take off points if you don't follow these directions. Do not type this homework assignment. It is a pain in the butt to get subscripts and superscripts right in Microsoft Word or in Google Docs. 
I do not want you to type this homework assignment. I want you to hand write it on a piece of paper and scan it with the Adobe Scan app or take a picture of it with your phone or your uh, Chromebook and upload a picture or a scan. I do not want you to type this homework assignment. Good luck. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Have a great day.